and welcome to the Christmas edition of the Library Loud Hailer, the monthly podcast of the National Library of New Zealand, Te Puna Mataranga o Aotearoa. We are coming to you live from the Lulbin room, so this is not the usual studio, so if you hear sirens in the background, it's just a bit of atmospheric noise. So I hope you've all had a wonderful and productive year, despite all the COVID challenges we've all faced. My name is Sean McMahon, and together with my special guests, we will be presenting some festive Christmas items from the collection. Today in the studio we have Ulu Afase, content analyst with the Pacific Virtual Museum. We also have Audrey War. Assistant Curator in the Contemporary Voices and Archives team. Kia ora. And Paul Diamond, Māori Curator with the Alexander Temple Library. Kia ora. So we might start with Ulu. Ulu, can you take us on a journey into a Christmas in Samoa? <laughs> well, so far, I'm laughing because I actually missed my cue. So, <laughs> Malo, everyone. Um, yeah, to be honest, Christmas in Samoa. I've only I've only done Christmas in Samoa once, and that was the lead up to my wedding. So, mm-hmm. but before that, last time I was in Samoa was in 1995. Mm-hmm. But um, no, it was aw- it was awfully nice. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess it's just just as I guess like a Kiwi Christmas. You know? Yeah, nice beach, but hot, hot. Yeah. yeah, way hot. I bet. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the items that I chose were, um, so there's two items, um, and I'll just go through the first one. The first one is, a, um, it's titled An Ephemeral Folder of October Size Relating to Samoa 1970 to 1979, and they consist of pamphlets um, of tourist destinations, so, um, Aggie Grays, for example, um, also promoting yeah to come to the islands mm. during Christmas, which unfortunately you know we can't. Uh, but um, Aggie Grays is quite a famous spot, isn't it? And yeah, there? it's a famous spot. I uh, heard so much, so many things about it, and uh, going to Samoa, uh, went in there, and yeah, it's really nice. I don't, I can't. I don't know the current state of it, mm. but I, I'm assuming because of lack of tourists, um, probably not as thriving as it usually is, but hopefully post-pandemic you can go back to its full mm, Get glory. back out there. Yeah. Mm. So some of these items were donated by the Department of Anthropology from Victoria University of Wellington uh, in 2001. And others were donated by Claire Murphy in 2014 and Rachel Brown in 2001. Okay. So, um, I mean, aside from the pamphlets and, you know, there's also, I think it will take listeners back, um, because we had an airline called Polynesian Airlines. And, uh, yeah, it has a timetable, so it'll be interesting for those who want to check it out. But the item that stood out for me was... uh, there's a Christmas card, mm-hmm. and the the title is uh, "Vailima Favaile Tua Samoa." Uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, and dated 1970. And uh, in the front, uh, it has it's a normal Christmas card. Um, inside has the message on the left, um, and on the right is a picture of uh, the head of state, uh, Malia Tua Tun um, Fili the Second. Okay. So he was he was head of state post independence, and um, he's standing there with next to a car, and um, and has a signature on the bottom right hand corner. So yeah, I think um, yeah, I guess I would compare compare that to receiving a Christmas card from the Queen, and yeah, I, th- I feel like that item has historic significance. So that's a real big deal? Yeah, for me it's a big deal. Mm. Um, 
yeah, I encourage anyone who's in Wellington to, um, or who's thinking of coming to Wellington to, uh, I think we might have a link of the item right, uh, you know, they can request it and have a look for themselves. Okay. Uh, that's important. Christmas card, yeah. And um, going into the second one, um, this one stood out to me because uh, I just had a lot of good memories about Christmas and uh, celebrating Island Christmas in Auckland, actually. And it's titled uh, Fereni Ete with um, babies who appeared in a Christmas play. And the photograph is taken by Ray Pigney, and this is in 1995. And uh, it talks about how the play fuses um, Christmas and Samoan culture and how it shows the baby Jesus being born in Samoa. So I guess for me it's just uh, significant because um, it, it's no secret that islanders go all out for Christmas. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think for church, uh, Christmas plays are quite a big deal. Christmas songs, uh, I think I mentioned before, how, you know, it's a second stressful day behind White Sunday. Like um, the amount of work that goes into plays and getting the songs right. And so, yeah, so some really good memories, but also uh, food as well. Yep. Church, food. Basically, uh, the main ingredients in an island Christmas. Ticks all the boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we were saying before, is that you notice much difference between a, a Christmas in the islands in Samoa and, you know, one here in Aotearoa? Yeah, they're, they're relatively the same. Mm. It's just, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not, I would say for most islanders, it's not as, uh, it's not as, a, it's not really a secular holiday, if you know what I mean. It's the focus is on the religious aspect, and and then with Pacific um, culture comes in the coming together and sharing a meal, and uh, yeah. So those are the two main components mm. of a Pacific Christmas, which I love and enjoy. Yeah, so it's a um, really big deal, and also like. Um, I just remember my auntie, like, she always does her house up in Massey in West Auckland. <laughs> she always does her house up with the lights and everything. Yeah, it's quite a spectacle. And, yeah, so we go all out. Yeah. yeah it's such an enjoyable time. Is your auntie competing with the neighbours? Like, some streets, well, every house has a guy and puts no, lights up. <laughs> funnily enough, the neighbours are starting to compete with her. Because <laughs> I... I I think she. I think she's done it since the early two thousands, oh, and then, okay. then they then they took a break from it a couple of years back, and now they've resumed doing it again. So yeah, yeah. and there's always this whole like um, tradition of uh, um, different churches, um, youth ah. groups coming to my auntie's place and singing like you know carols, like yeah, Samoan carols and that. I also forgot the Samoan name for it, but yeah. Um, that's always a big deal. Just busloads of like church groups coming to her house and singing. Yeah, so it's really cool. No, I miss that. Yeah, I'd love to hear it myself. Um, I'm sure yeah. it's spectacular to hear. I'm, I'm not that good of a singer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I heard a rumour of something about Jim Reeves and your family. Was that true? Listen oh, to Jim yes, Reeves no. That's, that's always the album. My, my father-in-law has has done that now okay. he, he's carried that on and playing the Jim Reeves Christmas album <laughs> and it's always a, yeah it's either that or Elvis or yeah the oldies <laughs> would, would always play those kind of Christmas songs there's no Mariah Carey like no, <laughs> like, no, no they don't play that it's Jim Reeves or, or nothing no else. Jim Reeves yeah, or yeah, nothing yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah my father used to listen to Tom T. Hall you know, on, on a Sunday after church. So <laughs> country and western, maybe there's a yeah. link there between that and the Catholic Church, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I just want to give a shout-out to my family in Auckland, yeah, because this will be the, the third Christmas I haven't spent with them. But, mm. yeah, I mean, currently, I mean, it's not really that safe in Auckland at the moment, but, yeah, I just hope that they're safe in Auckland spending their Christmas time so mm -hmm. yeah so yeah miss them heaps and mm. 
So, yeah. That's well, that's great. Thank you, Ulu. That was uh, lovely to hear about yeah. the Samoa on Christmas. Um, so now we might transfer over to me, and I'll have a, a more of a, a traditional New Zealand Christmas, really. So I'm going to read an extract from uh, The End of the Golden Weather, which is a play by Bruce Mason. Uh, and the play's about a boy's loss of innocence and depression here in New Zealand in the 1930s. It was written for solo performance. Uh, it was turned into an award-winning film by M. Yoon in 1991. The original play was workshopped in 1959, performed in 1960, published 62, and then again in uh, 1970, and it was later performed at the Edinburgh Festival. Uh, Bruce Mason had performed this play around New Zealand over a thousand times, so he'd covered all the major cities plus all the small towns throughout New Zealand. The section I'm reading from is from a, a chapter in the play called Christmas at Te Paranga, and Te Paranga is a fictitious beach which is basically Takapuna where Mason grew up, um, and so he set it in this fictitious beachfront township on Auckland's North Shore. As I said, it's in the 1930s, and the boy who is the is the main character is nameless throughout the play, uh, but he's, he's uh, about 12, they say, is the memory that Mason is going back to to his childhood. Right. Christmas Eve. A day as long as a year of penance. In the kitchen. My mother's face is flushed from the stove from which all day she has drawn forth cakes, scones, biscuits, mince pies. They stand on the bench outside, cooling in the shade, platoons of them, four abreast, marching into the barracks of abundance. My brother and I hide behind the door until our mother leaves the room, creep in like conspirators making the secret sign of their orders, fingers crooked, scoop them into bowls of icing, chocolate, lemon, vanilla, and feel the cool, sharp flavours sting our tongues. Caught once, Smacked, sent outside. Caught twice, smacked harder, sent to the beach. My father comes home early, springing without the weight of the year. A fortnight to go before he shoulders the next load of days. He changes into shorts, fills the glass with beer, bubbles with talk. As my mother passes him, weary, abstracted, he sweeps her up on his knee, nuzzles into her neck. She screams and smacks him. The kitchen is full of laughter. On a mantelpiece, a hundred cards shout greetings in a hundred scripts. Santa Claus, reddish-cheeked, ice-blue-eyed, his face a mask of merriment, guides his sleighs through flaking snow or pauses by a chimney, weighed down by the magic freight. Greetings, greetings, greetings. How's the wife? How's the kids? What's the news of Uncle Jim? The world's voice, rich, thick and loud, raised in a mighty chorus of solicitude. And I, pious and smug, my mind swilled clean with the foaming suds of good wool, take my brother off to church for Christmas Eve. The long nave sucks us down towards the altar, dim and ruddy glowing all around. Devout, dark heads bob, on a trough of gloom, like corks on a mysterious sea. Mr. Thrill at the pulpit, a huge benign penguin. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. The star of the wise men, white shepherds watched away in a manger the child. All the immemorial images softly falling, slowly sinking through the mine like distant jewels. A great bronze eagle on the pulpit, wings spread for flight, glares at the book, daring it to be true. Christmas morning. The dead pillow slips alive, miraculously quickened in the night. The word made bulging flesh, tearing of paper, shouting, turning keys in the clockwork innards, stifling chagrins that the watch isn't real, that the doll doesn't speak. Warning voices from the bedroom, don't disturb your mother, she's tired, creeping in to see if it's true, 
weary, bleary parents, faces tight with tiredness, and the effort of good wool at five in the morning, laughter crackling and spouting, love, love. By 10 o'clock on Christmas morning, the sun wraps Te Paringa around like a hot oilskin, searing the back undershirt, stinging bare arms and legs. A clear green sea edges up the beach and finically slaps like a coy woman, marking its progress in half hoops of delicate froth. We rush to immerse ourselves in the glittering element, shouting, Merry Christmas to our friends, to our parents, watching the eyes and watching the faces for signs of grace. Will Mr Johnson's hard old dial, as blank as a prison wall, fissure and crack with the earthquake of a smile? No, it won't. But he mutters through closed thin lips, Merry Christmas, lad. Oh, and look at crabby old Miss Mackie, who never ventures further in than ankle deep, never allows herself more pleasure than a cold dow sleuth of her mottled flesh rippling shoulders or a hand scroop of sea to slosh in her cavernous armpits. Look at her now, moving slowly and majestically out to sea, powered by an antique breaststroke, a noble and dignified old whale. And out we come, dripping and gleaming, our souls unsullied, white in the glorious, no past, no future, only in the immaculate present, endlessly pouring its essence upon us. The day moves on, so white and generous that nothing must sully it. What? Tears on Christmas Day? What? Quarrelling on Christmas Day? As though on any other day these were sins, were venial, but today, mortal. Every irritant, however slight, is mercifully held up to show its hideous blackness on the white sheet of Christmas. Peace on earth for 24 hours. Fatigue shall be banished. Discomfort shall not be admitted. Smiles will be fixed on Christmas Day and worn like honourable decorations until the clock striking 12 proclaims release. So that's an extract from End of the Golden Weather. And we have touched on Auckland today already. So um, Stephen Lovett, who was a well-known New Zealand actor, performs um, extracts from this work every Christmas day at Takapuna Beach. He's been doing it for the last 15, 16 years. So if you're fortunate enough to be in Auckland this Christmas, it'll be well worth going down to the beach and seeing Steve's rendition of the play. Currently, he's actually touring the play around the country, but that's actually been... Um, put on hold because of COVID, so um, he'll have plenty of time to practice it. But Ulu on that, it's, it's, it's interesting there, that's like the 1930s, but the, the church is very dominant there in that piece, and um, the food is also very dominant, so, you know, there's a lot of passing of time and cultures, but there's a lot of things that hold us together. Yeah, true. That's right. Yeah. Now, Audrey... I think you've got something special for us over there in the ephemera section. Yeah, I certainly do. Um, with Ulu and Sean, your depictions come back to what Christmas is all about. And today I've decided to look at some of the commercialisation and advertising that surrounds Christmas. It's inescapable. Um, I've selected a festive lithograph in red on white paper from the library's ephemera collection. And this was produced by Whitcomb and Tombs um, in Cashel Street, Christchurch. Um, for those of you who don't know, a lithograph is a form of printing using plates, which can be made of stone or metal, to create multiple copies of an illustration. And this was particularly convenient for advertising and promotion. The library purchased this item from Anna Dunsheath in 2002 to build up our ephemera collections relating to retail, significant New Zealand companies like Whitcomb and Tombs, and as early examples of lithographs. This illustration shows Father Christmas with a long white beard, wearing a classic Santa hat and a Whitcomb and Tombs limited satchel. He's walking through the doorway and carrying a sprig of mistletoe in his hand. Father Christmas is being greeted by a crowd of excited children who are almost falling over themselves to get to the presents and to meet the big man himself. And there's even one little boy who has actually fallen on the floor in his excitement. 
Inset labels floating around the children show that consumers can purchase the following sought-after goods. Hand-painted Christmas cards, picture books, pocket books, Christmas cards of New Zealand scenery which were particularly appealing, photographic albums, purses, gold and silver pencil cases, plated ink stands and handsomely bound table books. These advertisements were distributed to Christmas shoppers promoting a range of products made by local Whitcomb and Tombs. The company was established in 1882 and had stores around New Zealand. The company would later merge with Cools, Somerville and Wilkie to form the familiar Whitcalls Limited. I imagine some of our listeners are doing their Christmas shopping with Whitcalls this month. I know as a librarian, I both receive and buy books to give out to my friends and family. Compared with the modern Christmas traditions we see now in New Zealand of a summer beach Christmas, Santa and Jandals and the barbecue on, maybe even a beer in hand, in this depiction we see a Eurocentric Christmas and Father Christmas in this advertising. And this shows the influence of the time. The Northern Hemisphere and traditions of England were clearly an impact on New Zealand advertising. It was run in 1886, so you can imagine that many families who migrated to New Zealand would be experiencing their first summer Christmas, leaving behind the cold, snowy, feasting Christmases of home. I don't know about you guys, but I think I'd certainly prefer a a summer Christmas out on the beach. Yes, I would certainly agree with that, and uh, the trick in Wellington is trying to find, A, some summer to go to the beach. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yeah, so uh, I used to shop there when I was a kid at Wickham and Tombs on Latin Key, so it's now where Glassons and Hellensteins are. Mm. So that was the original, original building in Wellington. And I think it's very, very true that it's the, the types of um, items on offer there. It's very different today where everyone wants a Nintendo or they want something high tech. Back there, it was more sort of practical pens, papers, books, you know, colouring things and, 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 and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. And as a printer and book publisher, they made their start with compulsory primary schooling in 1887. Yeah. So then they really cornered the educational market, but now they've really expanded to anything and everything your heart desires. It sounds like we're promoting Whitcalls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are promoting Whitcalls. It's a phenomenon, though, isn't it, that how religious texts, how much they were sought after back then, you know, and, and a publishing company could be founded around the publication of religious texts. Absolutely. It's just, uh, you know, now it's romantic novels and things, you know, so it's very, it's a bit of a move there. A bit of a shift, and I imagine getting a, a Bible or being handed down the family yes. Bible was quite a significant Christmas present. Absolutely. There are, you're talking sort of uh, family heirloom type things mm. there with a nice Bible that, you know, comes down and ends up going into the Turnbull Library. I mean, I'm not saying that, but just <laughs> we do have a few li- we do have a few Bibles in, in the library. Yeah. So, Paul, welcome, Kia ora, yeah. and um, looking forward to uh, your piece here. Well, I've sort of taken inspiration from Audrey and, and um, found something in ephemera. Oh, fantastic! And um, but it's kind of related to what kind of has been keeping one of the projects that's been keeping me busy in 2021. The project to digitise this collection of books that the Turnbull Library catalogued a few years ago called Books in Māori. Okay. So that's a bibliography. It's just a list of not just books, actually, everything they could lay their hands on in 2004 that had been printed in Māori. Newspapers, magazines, posters, flyers, everything. And But it went, only went up to 1900. And we've gradually, st- we're beginning the project to digitise that and make it available on Papers Past. But when I... When the call, the annual call, came out for Christmas material, I put in Kurihimete into the catalogue and found a pass that was actually bought. I remember this being purchased by Audrey's predecessor, Barbara Lyon, um, 2013. It was bought at auction. And it's a little pass, a little card, and it's digitised, so we'll have the link on the website so you can actually see, um, look at this for yourselves. And it's sort of a pinky a pinky purple colour and it says um, he pāhi whakamaharatanga rātana pā te hui o te krihimete me te new year tihima um, uh, ruatakauma ruatakauma toru te hanuere kotahi um, 1930 so it went from 1929 to 1930 this was the Christmas hui uh, that they had at rātana pā so this is the settlement 
um, just south of Wanganui on the west coast of the North Island, mm. where Ratana, Tahu Potiki Wurimu Ratana, founded uh, the movement and faith, the, the Ratana Church. So people might know that in January, um, there are the commemorations of Ratana's birth on the 25th of January, um, 1873. And the politicians go up, but that's just one of the days. There's a whole lot of other days for okay. Ratana followers, adherents. Um, but the one that gets all the attention is when the politicians go. But interestingly, in 1929 and 1930, it was on December the 25th. And I saw a reference saying that Ratana's birthday was on Christmas Day, but apparently that's not thought to be right now. But anyway, that year they had the hui then. And that's what this little card is commemorating. And the, there's just two sentences on this card, and it says, He pāhi whakamaharatanga tēnei no tēnei hui, ka hapāinga e piriwiri tsua te triti o waitangi a pataia ana ki a honore wīti minita a te kāwanatanga mehemea ke te ora no te triti kua mate rānei. So that first sentence is saying, this is a little memorial card pass um, for this hui that was um, organised by Piriwiri Tsua to Tiriti Waitangi. Um, and these were names that Ratana gave himself. Um, so Piriwiri Tsua was the campaigner. Okay. And it's interesting that he actually adopted, um, I think this is right, adopted to Tiriti Waitangi as a title. Ask the um, Minister of the Crown, and I was a little bit puzzled about this Weezy, but I did a little bit of research on papers past, and Veach was the um, MP for Wanganui. Oh, right. And he represented okay. the government mm -hmm. at this hui. So this is how things were translated because the letters, there aren't as many letters in the Māori alphabet, so things got translated, uh, transliterated, sorry. So it was, the question was asked by Ratana, you know, the, does the treaty live or not? And then the last sentence is Faka Utswa ana timinita, kaite ora no waihoki, whakatako toria ana hekaupapa, e te rimamono whāro uh, tangata i hui mai ki tēnei hui hei whakakotahi i te iwi Māori e maranga ai te triti o Waitangi. So the minister answered, yes, it, it, it does live indeed. And furthermore, um, there was this kaupapa laid down by the 5,400 5, people who went to that hui um, to unify the Māori people and that last part, e maranga ai te triti o Waitangi to um, uplift or, you know, give life to, I guess, um, the, the Treaty of Waitangi. So I thought that was interesting. So you've got, um, there were apparently 24,000 people um, followed the Ratana Church in 1930, and when the population was only 67,000, that was 36% of Māori were, were members. It's still significant. Apparently, the latest figures, it's more than 40,000 people, and there's se also several thousand in Australia. Okay. So it's still the biggest mm. Māori religious faith. And just to finish, just I was able to find a little bit of context in Wonderful Papers Past, which actually we have just launched another part to that of the books interface, which is where some of these books in Māori that we've been working on it can be found. So there's now a whole separate section where people can look at books. But to find this information, I found, um, I just did a little search. I narrowed it down to um, papers from that part of the country. Because unfortunately, we don't have, um, there is a Ratana newspaper, um, but we don't have all the copies. And it's just made me think there actually is a project to sort of look at that and mm. talk to the church archives and see if we could well, uh, perhaps someone is um, digitising that, but that's where I thought of looking, but I thought, well, well, I'll look at the other papers, and amazingly, the Manawatu Standard, someone from the Manawatu Standard did a huge article that to print took me eight pages, and this was a great big in-depth feature. Obviously, this person understood Māori or had access to someone who did. All the other references were to how many crayfish there were right. on the trucks that were seen <laughs> arriving, you know, what people were eating. But this one went into the detail and there were these speeches when the minister arrived. And then there's this, these two little bits that tell us really, I think, what was going on that led them to produce this little printed pass. Mr T.W. Ratana then extended a welcome to Mr Veach, saying, I desire to support all the sentiments already expressed. I desire to bring before your notice the Treaty of Waitangi. Is the Treaty of Waitangi still in existence, or has it fallen into abeyance? If the treaty is still effective, then I humbly ask that the promises may be fulfilled. And 
In his answer, the Honourable Mr Veach said, my answer to the question of the Treaty of Waitangi is this, that it is still effective. Governments may not have kept, to it, kept it to the letter, but the fundamental principles have been adhered to. So that really does match what was in this little pass. And they obviously thought that was such a significant thing that they had this little card printed for that. But it's when I sort of looked at this and I thought, well, that's 1929 to 1930, there weren't even the commemorations. The commemorations began in 1934, right, two okay. years after Afterwards. the Governor-General mm. Bledisloe and his wife bought the, ha the treaty house and mm. gave it to the country. Mm -hmm. And it, just as a reminder that, well, A, it's interesting that Ratana had these commemorations at Christmas, not in January, and I wonder when that changed. But it's kind of a reminder that um, Ratana has always had this political side to it, and that you know, when people say, oh, this corridor about the treaty is quite recent, the Ratana certainly were talking about this very early on, before, before even the country was commemorating mm. Waitangi Day. And it did access to a lot of people there if there's over 5,000 people on one day or 20,000 people over the whole time. Mm. So and some of the Māori leaders at the time, you know, really saw this as a threat because it was really mobilising, you know, it's 36% of the whole mm. population. Mm. So Fantastic. So all from that little wee card that um, Barbara Lyon added to the collection uh, when she spotted it at an auction in 2013. Wow. And does it cover the, the Ratna bands? Because that's usually covered in these sort of um, media things because they're so, such a well-known... This is it the brass band, such mm. a well-known band? Yeah, that's a real feature. Yeah, and there are different yeah. bands from around the country and then they all go to, to Ratna. And I'm, uh, I, I remember when I went to Ratna to cover one of these days for the for Māori television and for Radio New Zealand, um, I didn't really understand that, 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 that when they, these people identify as Diwi Moruhu, that's, mm. that's, that almost sits above their tribe, because I'd say, oh, where are you from? And they'd say, Diwi Moruhu. And I'd say, no, 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 where are you from? Where are you, where, you know, no, Diwi Moruhu. And they, or then they'd say, oh, Ngāpui. But, but actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible pan Māori thing. Mm. And the temple, I think, had only just opened in January that year, the Te Teme Para Tapu or Ihua, the Holy Temple of Jehovah, that really distinctive temple that's there that a lot of the other temples are kind of um, similar and designed to with the two towers, that, that had opened in January. So this is really, this movement is just sort of really growing mm. in strength and doing all these incredible things. And I'd love, uh, it's, a, it's a shame that um, newspapers back in 1930 didn't have um, bylines. Because it would be, re I guess, it might be possible to tell. The Manawatu standard, um, I guess, that's what became the Evening Standard. Yeah, um, because I, it's wonderful to have that, and it's wonderful that we have it on papers past. Absolutely. Mm. Well, kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Paul. Mm. And so, getting near the end of the, the session now, and I thought I'd just ask Cecil what we plan to do for Christmas Day. I'm getting an appetite now for food and beer and and, and going swimming. Actually, from what I've heard so far. Paul, what are you up to? Well, just talking about New Zealand Christmases and things, you know, mm. I've had a... Actually, I've had two partners who are from the Northern Hemisphere and I know they've found our Christmases really disorienting because it just doesn't feel right. And I know when I was in Germany for Christmas one year where everything happens on the 24th, that's the day, <laughs> right. the evening. Yes, yeah. So they, they have this crazy scramble to get everything ready because they have their big dinner and the presents on the 24th. And it's winter and... Um, I found it amazing and interesting, but it did feel odd to me. And I think it's what I like about our Christmases is that um, we're developing our own traditions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the red, the red robin, bobbing along. I mean, he's gone now. Yeah. You know, in the snow, <laughs> uh, we we are developing our own traditions. We're developing our own traditions about what we eat. But actually, I think a lot of people after the year we've had will just be kind of just. I don't know, I'm just quite happy to sit and read and eat chocolate almonds, really. I think so, yeah. <laughs> and drink champagne. Yeah, yeah, well, not much travelling going on. Audrey? I think our Christmas this year is going to follow that classic Christmas on the beach song. I don't know if anyone recalls, but one of the lines is, pack your picnic hamper up, we're going to have a feast. Oh, fantastic. So, well, up to Waikanae Beach, pack the dog in the car, yeah. got to see my family up there. I think, yeah, really it's all about coming together this year. The food is always going to be a feature, but just kind of recognising that we've been through quite a challenging time mm. and it all comes down to the connections we have, whether it's your, your family, your friends, go out and reconnect, whether it's on Zoom or in person, and give someone a big hug. Yeah, I think so. Everyone deserves a big hug after this year. Mm -hmm. 
Ulu, you've touched on already, but have you got any further things you want to share on your Christmas? No, I think I think just no, I think we're just planning to drive around I think on Christmas Day. Um, church, obviously, yeah, is the main thing. But yeah, just um, looking forward to um, my mother-in-law's an awesome cook, so, <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm always the greatest like sous chef. Uh, yeah, so it's the best place to be, I think, in, in the kitchen cooking because yeah, you get yeah. to taste everything before it goes out. <laughs> like the yeah. spoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I noticed, like, too, with like, I think it's probably for everyone how there's always, um, you know, a barbecue expert that comes out of the, <laughs> yeah. comes out of nowhere and wants to <laughs> criticize like, how you're cooking stuff. So, yeah, no, just a quiet one. Yeah. Um, still massive feed church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It so sounds good. It sounds wonderful. Yeah. So for myself, I guess um, going up with uh, my wife and the kids to Dunyvik and to the heartland of New Zealand, and so we'll be celebrating a, a Christmas up there, which is always fun. It's always Southern Hawks Bay, so I usually get good weather there, and maybe get to church, Catholic church, on a Sunday or whatever day it is. It's Saturday, isn't it? I think this year Christmas Day. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, and um, I guess for me, it's like the Irish thing. It's the Stephen's Day or as you call it in New Zealand Boxing Day, is the day after and it's sort of, you know, it's a big day for racing and I sort of come from a racing family. So it's sort of, you have that eating on the Christmas day and the chair, but you're sort of in anticipation that the next day is when it happens. And so you sort of do the family thing and then the next day, St Stephen's Day, Boxing Day comes around and then you're off, you know. Pubs open at 12 or whatever, you're on the racetrack and it's sort of, it's the start of the real Christmas thing, like Paul was saying. In the north, you have your Christmas, but then you're back to snow and it's cold and you've got nothing to look forward to. Down under, it's the start. We've got this whole summer ahead of us. Christmas Day's finished. We've had our obligations and we're free. So um, I remember yeah. one of my grandfathers going to the races I at Auckland on Boxing Day, but yeah. I've also heard jokes about Germans who come here and they go, and when is the boxing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very, it is a bit confusing. I know. Yeah. Well, I never use. I mean, Ireland is the Saints, it's St. Stephen's the Saints, so it's sort of obvious. But I gather Boxing Day means it's the day after when you've unwrapped your presents and you're putting away your boxes that the presents came in. And and you know, you the term a box room. What well, a box room is a spare room in your house where you store your boxes. So I think that is where it's come from. I hope I'm not making that up. <laughs> I should have done my research. I must talk to a journalist. <laughs> Get a fact check on that one. Get a sure. fact check on that one, yeah, yeah. But we do know it's not about that. It's yeah. not about Ooh, boxing, no, on. no, yeah. my God. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there are occasional <laughs> fisticuffs in some families when mm. they had too much to drink, but... Uh, I think we should establish that that's the original Black Friday. <laughs> <laughs> boxing Day's the original. I've, I mean, I've heard many of, like... Family oh, friends, yeah, yeah, family <laughs> friends, and that you know they they actually get their Christmas gifts on Boxing Day. Ah, than, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, just want to establish <laughs> that. You know. Or sorry, to, all the sorry presents. to Jay here, who's American, but <laughs> yeah, Boxing Day is the original Black Friday in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Return those presents. Yeah. Oh my God. No, keep the presents. Keep the presents. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for turning up again for. Um, this Christmas edition. Unfortunately, Mary couldn't be with us today. Um, she's my co-host, but she's unable. So we miss you, Mary. We, you would have loved this. Um, but a thanks to Mary for all the work she's done during the year. And to Jay, I'm looking across. You should have a microphone because we can't interview him because there's, there's one microphone down. <laughs> but Jay, for all your wonderful work as a sound engineer for the year, that's fantastic. And Aaron Wano, who's our producer, he's also away today and, and can't make this. So Shout out to you for all the work you've done, Aaron. Um, and then to Ulu, Paul and Audrey, um, thanks for coming along. And um, Ulu, thank you for your podcast during the year. Um, we did two this year and you were one of them. That was a, a fantastic one you gave during the year. Cheers. Love you to have that. And then Paul, of course, you were here last year and we've had you on. You were the first, the first one we've had on Pukana and Audrey. Back again this year. Becoming and hopefully, a bit of a tradition. Yeah, now, we, <laughs> well, hopefully we'll see more of you in the new year um, so the podcast will be back next year we're just having the pilot has finished so we're just putting through a, a case for the podcast to be um, you know business as usual and we might grow the team so we might grow include people like Audrey and other people who are interested um, to join the team to, to make it bigger we're also working with Sam's um, 
New Zealand digital team to build the RSS feeds. So we're hoping early next year we'll have a feed which will then mean that we have the show on the web website, but we will also have it on Spotify, Apple and Google and, and wherever else we need a third party. So that's going to be a big thing um, for us next year. So have a, a great Christmas, everyone. Um, be safe, look after yourselves, mind the COVID. And as a treat, the music this year is a, a piece from the Turnbull Library Choir, a.k.a. the Horsberg. And this year we're going out on a song you may have heard, A Pukeko in a Ponga Tree, which is uh, written by Kingi Ihaka in 1981. And, and of course, it's taken from the original The Twelve Days of Christmas. Um, and so this is the version from our choir. So look after each other. Kia kaha and ka kitiano. Toru fa. On the first day of Christmas, my, my true love gave to me a pukeko in a ponga tree. On the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me two kumana and a pukeko in a ponga tree. On the third day of Christmas, my true love gave to me three fat kids, two kumara, and a pukeko in a ponga tree. On the fourth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me four who grubs, three flax kids, two kumara, and a pukeko in a ponga tree. On the fifth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Five big fat pigs, four hoo grubs, three flax kids, two kumara, and a pukeko in a ponga tree. On the sixth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me six poya twirling, five big fat pigs, four hoo grubs, three flax kids, two kumara, and a pukeko in a ponga tree. On the seventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me seven eels of swimming, six poya twirling, five big fat pigs, four hoo grubs, three flax kids, two kumara, and a pukeko in a ponga tree. On the eighth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Eight plants of puha, seven eels of swimming, six poya twirling, five big fat pigs, four hoo grubs, three flax kids, two kumara, and a pukeko in a ponga tree. On the ninth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me nine sacks of pippies, eight plants of puha, seven eels of swimming, six poya twirling, five big fat pigs, four hoo grubs, three flax kids, two kumara, and a pukeko in a ponga tree. On the tenth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Ten juicy fish heads, nine sacks of pippy, eight plants of puha, seven eels of swimming, six poya twirling, five big fat pigs, four hoo grubs, three flax kids, two kumara, and a pukeko in a ponga tree. On the eleventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me eleven hockalusons, ten juicy fish heads, nine sacks of pippy, eight plants of puha, seven eels of swimming, six poya twirling, five big, big fat pigs, four hoo grubs, three flax kids, two kumara, and a pukeko in a ponga tree. On the twelfth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Twelve pew pew swinging, eleven hock and lessons, ten juicy fish heads, nine sacks of pippy, eight plants of puha, seven eels of swimming, six poya twirling, five big bad pigs, four hoo grubs, three flax kids, two kumana, and a poo.